And I would like to introduce to you our panel moderator, Ryan Ugalia Holland, Executive Director at Up Partnerships. Up Part. Yeah, give him a hand. Yeah. yeah. Up Partnerships is an education backbone that seeks to ensure all young people in San Antonio are ready for their future. An organizational builder, leadership coach, collective impact organizer, he has served as the executive director for Excel Beyond the Bell, San Antonio, and the YMCA of Metropolitan Chicago's Youth Safe and Violence Prevention Department. He is the leader in the Strive Together Network and serves on the chair of the board of directors for the Children's Funding Project Ryan was selected as the outstanding young San Antonian of 2020. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right. <laughs> By the Rotary Club of San Antonio. He received his PhD in urban planning and policy from the University of Illinois at Chicago and a BA in anthropology from the University of Chicago. Please give him and our panelists a warm welcome. Thank you. Round of applause for that. That's beautiful. And I think one of the things Jeff said when he welcomed us was not everybody's going to make it, right? Some of us are going to drop out. Uh, but Brian is a testament to what it means to stay with it. Um, just a quick note on the last panel. Another, another way to really sustain uh, the work and grow the work over time is local voter approved ballot measures. And so I want to ask Elizabeth Gaines from the Children's Funding Project to just raise your hand if you're interested in that. In San Antonio, talk to Elizabeth. In San Antonio, we have about 34 million a year coming in from sales tax money for our early childhood sector because of a local voter approved ballot measure. Um, so there's, there's, there's bad news and there's good news. The bad news is this is the last panel of the gathering. It's sad. The good news is this is an extremely brilliant, powerful, committed panel, <laughs> truly. And we're gonna, I'm gonna frame this in a second and then we're gonna flow, but the, the conversation is really about interdependence. And Jeff and I uh, were chatting briefly last night after Reverend Dr. Wyatt did what I would consider stand-up divinity. I've never seen stand-up <laughs> divinity like that. And, um, and we were talking like, what do we need to learn, what do we need to learn from faith communities? Uh, you know, whether, whether someone worships at a mosque or a temple or a synagogue or a church or what have you, what do we need to learn? And one of the things that feels clear is that when people show up to a service, they show up because they know they need each other. They are very, very clear that they need each other. And they're clear on that because they're very, very clear of their own profound limitations. And that is, that is a, that's a foundational awareness that I think we all have, have lived and we all live on a regular basis and we help others to live in our communities, but we must continue to live and double down on the awareness that our incapacity makes us need each other, right? And it really brings us into this work in a deeper way. Jeff, you're gonna have to tell us, you know, if that's how the Army functions, if, that's, if, if we're still learning the rules on that, but well, we look forward to that. But we know that's how neighborhoods function, right? And for neighborhoods to really be communities, folks there recognize their limitations so that when things go down, whether that's a blackout in New York or a freeze in Texas or a break-in or, or what have you, right? we need to be in relationship with the people around us. And it's much better to build those relationships before things go down. We're in a much better, a much better space. And part of today's panel is really about, if we think about this field as a neighborhood, we're all co-located, right? How do we become more of a community, right? How do we move from that co-location to collaboration that Carol talks about? And that's the journey we're on. And it's an honor to be on the journey with these incredible folks. So I'm just gonna start with Wendy and just do what I want to name is one way that San Antonio, the city that I'm proud to represent, needs each of these leaders. And that'll just be a small entry point, and then they'll be building um, on their incredible contributions and legacies as they share. They're all going to be responding to three questions uh, as we go, and then we're going to protect time for at least one or two questions from the audience. So Wendy, San Antonio needs you and needs the Wilson Institute because we need to be recruited to the Army of Love. We need that, and we're ready for you to do that. And Jen, we need you, and we need your team, and we need the Opportunity Accelerator, because you have a powerful vision on how to transform local government, and we have a local government that sometimes they know it, sometimes they don't. They need to transform, and you're already laying amazing groundwork for that. Takima, San Antonio needs you, 
because we don't know how to really help build the capacity of our grassroots organizers to bring them into this space at an equal footing, and we need you to help us, and we need Converge to help us get there. And Jen, you've been investing in San Antonio and our work for years. We need you to continue to bring your wisdom and your team and your leadership through Strive Together. Um, and we know that neighborhoods exist within regions, right? And sectors and systems operate at a regional level. And those sectors and systems set constraints and possibilities for neighborhoods in powerful ways. And you continue to teach us about how to work on that systems change. And Carol, we need more neighborhoodists in San Antonio. And we need, we need purpose built in San Antonio. And we need, um, we need you to help build those bridges for our neighborhood leaders and champions so that they can learn from the incredible work that you and your network of neighborhoodists do every day. And Robert, the work that you've done in Broward County is amazing. We have 17 school districts in Bear County. Um, at least half of them would love to meet with you and learn more <laughs> about the work of Chiefs for Change and just um, and the incredible way that you have decided to take the model that you built in Broward County and now help to scale that nationally through Chiefs. So we need all of you and we all need each other. And so that's what we're gonna, we're gonna get into right now. Um, so Wendy, for, we're just gonna work the line and then once everybody answers, feel free to you know, respond to each other. But um, who, do you, who are your stakeholders? What do they do and how do you support them? Sure. Um, so the Wilson Institute really focuses on organizations that are committed to doing place-based cradle-to-career work within at least one neighborhood. So that can be regional backbones, neighborhood backbones, neighborhood direct service providers who are interested in covering the entirety of a cradle-to-career pathway, or turning into a backbone using partnerships to fill gaps in cradle-to-career programming, but that's really our sweet spot, folks who are working at the neighborhood level who are actively doing that in at least one place. Hop on in, Jen. Sure. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jen. And the Opportunity Accelerator is a partnership of five national organizations that are working with government to really help improve economic mobility and close racial disparities. And we do that by making government a better partner to all of you and helping them understand what their roles are, how they are as actors in this larger ecosystem that's working to strengthen the well-being of children and families in our communities. Hi everybody, I'm Takima. Um, I'm the CEO and founder of Converge. Our purpose to, is to accelerate the creation of a radically just new world where communities of color thrive. Um, and this looks like supporting organizations, um, coalitions who are committed to shifting and building power. And power we define as the ability to shape the rules. And so we support backbone organizations, coalitions, community, neighborhood service providers, policy advocacy organizations, and also grassroots community organizations and movement groups. They focus on a range of issues, so education, reproductive justice. We do a lot of work in the democracy space with um, organizations like ACLU, as well as Fair Fight in Georgia, um, but we also do a lot of work in reproductive justice um, and supporting um, groups like you all who are doing work around uh, cradle to career and economic mobility. Good morning, I'm Jennifer from Strive Together. And at Strive Together, our purpose is to ensure that every child, regardless of race, ethnicity, zip code, or circumstance, has every opportunity to thrive and reach their full potential. And we do that through supporting a national network of 70 communities who are primarily working at the regional level, although certainly there are many represented in this room who are doing intense neighborhood work. Um, but our work is really about uh, creating more equitable systems that drive more equitable outcomes for every child. Uh, and we do that um, in partnership with stakeholders like those of you in this room. Hey, good morning, everybody. My name is Carol Naughton. I'm with Purpose Built Communities. Purpose Built Communities is a national nonprofit based in Atlanta that supports 28 network members around the country who are working to strengthen neighborhoods, neighborhoods that were created by the racist policies and practices of our government and private sector <coughs> actors over the last 400 years. And what we work what we do is work with people who live in that neighborhood and other stakeholders uh, around a very specific model of neighborhood revitalization that includes bringing high 
quality mixed income housing to a neighborhood, creating a neighborhood serving cradle through college education pipeline, and bringing community health and wellness partners to the neighborhood. These community quarterback organizations work with the community to help create a community vision and then help um, nurture and sustain the public private partnerships that are necessary in order to be able to um, make that vision a reality. And so our stakeholders are those community quarterbacks around the country and their partners. Um, we provide support both through one-on-one -on -one co um, coaching on a variety of topics with lots of different expertise internally, um, as well as through a community of practice, which has been something we started about two years ago that has been a game changer in harnessing the wisdom of folks doing this work around uh, the country to be able to help one another solve problems that they're dealing with on the ground every day. Uh, good morning, Bob Runcie, and I lead Cheese for Change. Uh, yesterday, I heard uh, Dr. Booker um, challenge uh, anyone in here who may be a superintendent uh, that superintendents need to get into the game. Um, I'm here to tell you that Cheese for Change represents those superintendents who are in the game who absolutely want to work with you. It's an organization, it's a bipartisan organization of state leaders, um, district leaders that lead systems uh, containing about 7 million students um, about 450,000 teachers, over 14,000 schools. Um, so we are really able to, and it's large districts to medium and small districts as well. So it's a really great cross section of the country. Uh, we work with our members and provide um, three primary strands of services. One um, is around technical support. So we help those systems solve some of their biggest challenges uh, that they may have um, in areas around student well being. Um, leadership in crisis, which many of our systems are in, and human capital issues around staffing shortages, uh, retention, um, so we, we do that work. And we also, on a quarterly basis, as we are doing that work, um, convene um, community-based organizations that are the backbone of the communities in which our school systems uh, reside and ensure that there's a good amount of information sharing and collaboration there. Um, secondly, um, we actually have a program called Future Chiefs. It's an 18-month program where we bring uh, promising uh, leaders from um, school systems um, and help them to develop. Uh, we then work to get them placed in superintendent positions. Uh, we've been very successful with that program over the last couple of years. We placed almost 30 individuals um, in school systems. We then provide support and coaching to them to ensure they're successful. And then finally, we work very closely um, with the administration here in Washington um, and uh, legislators on the Hill. Uh, we bring these chiefs to these individuals uh, to inform their policy making um, and, and legislative uh, initiatives that they have. So uh, that's cheese for change. Thank you all. Um, so quick question, please raise your hand if you have been mentored, supported, guided, coached um, by any of the institutions represented on this panel. That's at least 50 hands right there. Um, and so it, it's easy to kind of get, you know, lost in the language sometimes, but all of these institutions have really mastered how do, we, how do we support leaders to build stronger organizations to drive solutions at scale? And the level of scale represented by these institutions is fierce and formidable. And we're gonna, we're gonna dive into our next question, which is how do, we, how do we really best work together as a community to address the common challenges that neighborhoods face? And um, Wendy, I'll kick it to you again. Great, well, all of us have very distinct strengths and areas where we've been working for years and years. And frankly, in competencies that are really important for neighborhoods, for regions, um, for direct service. So I think there's a ton of skill sharing, capacity building that each of us bring to the table. And I think the Wilson Institute is positioned when we're talking about neighborhoods that aren't connected to another network, the Wilson Institute can support in collaborating and sort of aligning across all of our partners to make sure there aren't um, too many unaligned conversations going on in one place, but ensuring that as a plethora of partners come into a neighborhood, it's in an organized and aligned way and isn't too overwhelming for organizations we're collaborating with. You know, we are your public sector folks. We love local government, we love your state governments, and we also know that 
They're not always coming to the table with all the assets that they can bring and the resources they can bring as well. And Carol, you made a really good point that some policies and systems and structures that continue to perpetuate racism and inequities are held by government. And so our work is to actually work with all of you, but also build the capacity of our government leaders to understand one, how they can actually come to the table with the assets necessary, with data, with new procurement systems, with the valuations, with the ability to allocate and resource funding from federal, state, and local government to the programs and the services that are really working and actually meeting the needs of the communities that you all are serving, and also to build lasting relationships. I think all of us have the opportunity to work together and identify who are the right stakeholders, who are the right chief executives in government, who are the right um, commissioners and, and managers to bring to the table to really help you and understand what government can offer, and also um, hear from all of you what government government should be doing more and how they can be supportive. And so we're excited to continue to work with all of the stakeholders here, but also locally to find the bridges and start to build those trusting and long lasting relationships. So common challenges, how do we address them together? Um, so for Converge, our perspective always begins with the people. And I think we heard Michael McAfee talk about that. Do we love the people? And we hear this language, whether it's Brian Stevenson talking about proximity, um, but nothing about us without us is a lot easier to say than to do. And just in spending the last two days with you all, I've heard about the struggles and the challenges you all are having, really incorporating a grassroots perspective and centering the folks that you're serving in the work that you're doing. And so that's a big part of what we can do to address this common challenge is we can walk alongside of each other, learn together, um, and really figure out how do we operationalize centering the people that we serve um, as we also try to address the the oncoming inslaught of challenges that neighborhoods are constantly facing. Um, so first of all, we need to constantly center the people. Another thing that I think will support us in working together is also making sure we're clear about what our values are, including centering people, right, that we serve. That has to be a value that all of us ascribe to, and we have to be in interdependent relationship where we can also hold each other accountable, right, and hold each other accountable inside of those values, which I believe you have to include beloved community. Um, and so those are some of the things that I would offer that we need to bring to the table to address the challenges that we're facing. And building on uh, what's already been shared and Wendy's point that we all have our strengths as organizations. So at Strive Together, we're the systems people. We uh, really believe that uh, in order to get population level impact, you have to transform systems and that these systems that we have in our country have been designed to get exactly the results that they're getting, which none of us are happy about or we wouldn't be in this room. And so our work is really about supporting communities to transform systems. And we believe that you transform systems when you shift practices, policies, resources, and power structures. And we have um, built some expertise over the last decade in how to do that, and we are constantly learning from every one of these partners uh, up here on the stage uh, with me uh, to, to really how to accelerate that progress in communities. But we know that um, the change that happens at the incremental level has to get to scale, and to do that, our, our systems must be transformed. So plus one to everything that we've already set up here today. And uh, I'm thinking about the scale of the challenge that we face. Um, a few years ago, before the pandemic, we did a calculation to think about how many neighborhoods in this country needed the kind of interventions that Purpose Built offered, the kind of support that Purpose Built offered. And we came up with a number about 825. We think there's now probably 20% more than where we were two years ago. Um, Purpose Built doesn't need to, do, shouldn't be. The, the partner who is involved in all these neighborhoods, all of us need to be part of those change leaders um, in order to help bring these resources, these strategies, and um, the content to folks across the country. So um, we do that through coaching. Um, you know, every great team needs a great coach. Winning the Super Bowl doesn't happen because you've got a mediocre coach, 
right? You've got to have somebody who's in it to win it with you. And we want to be in it to win it with our network members for the people in the communities who are creating the visions that we're trying to, to bring to life. Um, so coaching happens in our world by purpose-built providing some one-on-one -on -one support, but more beautifully, it's happening now within the network. And to see network members identifying learning agendas that they want to be a part of, that they want to lead is really exciting. It's also very exciting when we see them identifying local challenges that they have and reaching out to their peers to solve problems that they would not have uh, otherwise been able to. So I'll give you a quick example. Um, one of our network members was really um, struggling with a homeownership group in the neighborhood where she was working. And they were um, skeptical, right? Rightly skeptical um, about saying, like, hey, we're here. We want to help, right? Um, and so they were working on building trust and building relationships. So she reached out to her quad partners. All of our network members have CEOs have a quad of local of folks that they can reach out to and they've built deeper relationships with. She reached out to her quad and got great advice on how to continue to build trust beyond a certain level. And it was transformative for this leader. So harnessing that kind of coaching as well as the coaching that you can get from a centralized organization like Purpose Built is what it's going to take to get us all to the next level. Uh, superintendents, district leaders, they get up every day because they love kids. They want to create great futures for them. Uh, but it's a complex job. It's enormously challenging. Uh, the political um, and divisive and toxic things that we see going on in this country, um, you see them working their way into um, school board meetings. I mean, you see everybody show up there. There's what you know we commonly call cave people, citizens against virtually everything. Um, <laughs> You know, they, they, everybody, everybody shows up and, and thinks they have a voice. Um, so, you know, what, what we also recognize is that our kids are only in the school system care for about a third of their day. The other two thirds, they're home, they're out in the community. So if we're really serious about um, ensuring that our students are gonna be able to achieve and do well in school, we have to be smarter about what we're doing and we have to collaborate with our community, the agencies, the community-based organizations, parents and families out there so that we can provide a continuum of support um, and, and provide holistic um, support to, to all the kids that are out there. Um, so we bring and, hope and bring our superintendents together uh, with leaders in the community, you know, great example, um, has been in Oakland with Oakland Thrives, uh, Dr. Melanie Moore, and um, Superintendent uh, Kyla uh, Johnson Trammell were on a call recently and talked about how they collaborated um, and it resulted in putting um, a couple dozen wellness centers um, across uh, the district. Um, but you know, as you go through that, you also learn about challenges that exist. And one of the big issues out there is data sharing. And I've run into that quite a bit um, when, you know, we've tried to share with the United Way, the Boys and Girls Club, so that we can align after school programs and resources and interventions to what's going on in the day. You run into these hurdles around FERPA, HIPAA, et cetera. Um, we've got to be able to overcome that and we can certainly use some national leadership to address that. Uh, because sharing information and having the data on these kids um, is really something I think that's critical to ensuring that there's a very tight level of collaboration and partnership between the school districts and all of the, uh, the organizations in our community. Out of applause. Ryan, can I respond Please, to that? Uh, well, just, uh, you know, this, I think it's a great example of how if we partner, um, we can address some of these because we've actually worked with Data Quality Campaign to develop a data sharing toolkit that helps uh, communities get past what are oftentimes um, in, like, not real barriers, FERPA and HIPAA, these types of things that uh, districts uh, put in place for data sharing. And that happens, I'm just gonna build on one more thing that Carol said, which is through the network effect. I mean, what, what you were describing, we call at Strive Together, is the network effect. When one community has put in place a data sharing agreement, that should be shared across all of our communities so that we're not reinventing the wheel and creating new templates. Absolutely. And that's really what the power of 
all of these networks coming together, I think, can, can get to. Can I also add, um, I know that sometimes it's hard to get data from your government partners. <laughs> and so I heard someone came up to me and say, we get our data once a year in a PDF, and it doesn't give us that much information. And what we want to do is actually build that capacity within government to be able to collect their data, to analyze it, to put it in readable format so that you have access to it on real-time basis and at the disaggregated level. So you're not just getting information um, that's broad, but you're understanding race, ethnicity, geography, so that not only government can make real-time decisions, but you can make real-time real decisions as well as you're thinking about the impact on, on children and families and communities. And so being able to partner and think about how do we, how do we take data sharing agreements from the community and also start to put them in place with government and so that there's a flow of information and data that can be shared and a place where everyone could access um, information that allows you to make decisions real time. So, uh, I can't tell, you picked up the mic, but I can't see your face. <laughs> well, I'll say this, because it's something that has been on my mind since yesterday. Someone made a comment that personal lived experience is just uncoded data. And if I'm the person on the panel representing community and making sure we're centering community in all that we do, I think it's also important to rem remember that when we talk about data, um, that there is data that's also locked inside of the people that we're serving that also needs to be coded and brought to the table. And, da and data collection too, right? Yes. Like every, every resident leader it carries that data with them uh, from what's happening around them. So um, the next question, y'all are all leaders and builders and catalyzers of this field. And we need to know from your perspectives, where does the field need to go? It could be building on the data inter interdependencies, building on the alignment, building on values-based accountability that Takima talked about, but, but where do we need to go? Well, well, happy to jump in here. Jennifer and I have an opinion on this, and I'm, my guess is everybody else does as well. So I, I think we are um, at the very beginning of really trying to identify what our field is, who we are, what our commonalities are, what our differences are. And I want to say it's OK. And it's actually a strength that we have differences of approach and differences of views of our, our strategies. N We've heard before over this com or this conference, there's not one silver bullet approach. It's going to take lots of different um, approaches, lots of different strategies, system level, neighborhood level, working together in order to be able to move forward. So for me, it is this is the beginning of trying to define a field. And I think part of that needs to start with um, identifying our values about people, about racial equity, about inclusiveness in order to be able then to move forward with thinking about what our strategies are. Because if we're aligned first on those important values, then I think we find places for all of us to hang our hat and find a meaningful role in this work. Yeah, I, uh, I think there's one word that continues to come to the top of mind as I think about many of the conversations we've had in this room over the last couple of days, and that is resources, right? And you know, I had this conversation um, uh, with Mr. Canada uh, yesterday, and one of the thoughts I've always had around this whole resource piece goes all the way back to May 1954, Brown versus Board of Education. And that whole strategy there was really based ultimately around uh, integration, um, ensuring it was uh, separate was not equal. Uh, but it wasn't too long after that that some of the folks who actually worked on that case, uh, including uh, Dr. Derek Bell, who, who worked on that, came to the realization that we had a, made a strategic error. And the strategic error was that we should have been fighting for equality in resources, right? And once you, once you, once you have that, you can get a lot of these things um, done. And you know, you look at the Harlem Children's Zone as an example, they got resources, right? They work for it, um, but they were able to get resources to accomplish what they were able to do. And you know, the interesting thing is in this day and age, uh, many organizations, including school districts, now have an unprecedented amount of infusion of cash. And uh, you know, we need to really work 
together collectively um, to take advantage of this moment to build infrastructure alliances that will allow us to not only use those funds wisely, but form what I believe are political alliances that will allow us to fight collectively to continue to sustain those le that level of funding and resources that need to come to us. So it, it's, it's not just about meeting, focusing on the work. I think as we do that, we develop relationships where we can work together on agendas politically to make sure that we get the resources that we need. And Yes, and I, I want to add to that because I do think that as we come together as a field, we have to hold ourselves accountable for moving a population level result. Right. And so often fields um, come together and, and you know work to galvanize resources, but don't have the shared accountability for result. And I know we've been talking about a million kids um, and we have to do more than a million kids. That's just the start. But um, we have to figure out what that shared identity is, what is that shared result, and then figure out how to measure whether or not we're making progress and continually measure and talk about that in our field building work. So what do we need for the field? Um, you know, we're in a really interesting moment in our country. You know, we know where, where we are right now uh, with democracy literally on the line. Um, and I think that our field needs to really start having a serious conversation about justice and not just equity, <laughs> and not just equity of outcomes, but we need to have a conversation about justice and le legitimately transforming these systems that continue to produce the same outcomes. Um, and that's gonna require building power, and power is not easy to measure. It's not easy to measure in the ways that we measure programs and services, right? It's diff it requires different types of resourcing. Um, and so to the point about resources, we have to fund that work just like we fund the programs and services work, right? Because without, without power in our community, we can't sustain the resources that we're attracting, right? We can't sustain the policy wins. And so I think our field really needs to move the conversation from equity to a conversation of justice. Um, everything that everyone has said and the fact that we all build networks and we all have large networks that we're working with. Many of you are in one, two, three of these networks. And once there is a shared agenda, once there is a shared uh, vision where we align on our core principles and values and what it means to work on racial justice, it, we have an opportunity to move our networks and to be able to bring people to conversations where they can have the, conver the ha same conversations that we're hoping to have with one another around shared resources and shared values and principles. And so the, the scale effect of this and the opportunity to be able to um, align as a field and then bring the movement with us and bring our networks with us is, and have them be a part of our conversation from the start, I think is a real opportunity. I would just add um, the articulation of what our field is and who we are as a field both so that family dinners become a lot easier when folks ask what we do, <laughs> and also for the, the purpose of recruiting talent. Um, yeah. If we wanna keep yeah. this field robust and grow this field, we have to be able to explain to folks who are potentially interested in joining us who we are, what we do, what our values are, what our outcomes are, um, but make it more tangible so that we can more easily funnel talent in to join us. Wendy, I had a mentor who said it's a miracle anytime two people understand each other. And I think in this line of work, when we're, when we're at the family dinner table talking about civic infrastructure, et cetera, then it's more than a miracle, whatever more than a miracle is. And um, I have a, my last question is actually for the room, which is um, you've heard talk, seeds planted around um, accountability, like what's our shared vision? How is the field defined? What are the shared values of, of these institutions that are shaping the field? You've heard Wendy, representing our host, the Wilson Institute, uh, talk about their willingness to create alignment uh, among these players and in this space. And, and you've heard about like um, the need to be held accountable by outside parties. So how many of you, by a show of hands, would be willing to hold this incredible team accountable to show up with that shared definition, those shared vision and values moving forward. Just raise your hand if you'd be open to that to hold, so that we can bring the best out of each other moving forward. 
So just take that mental image, right? And, and Wendy, can we hold you accountable and the institute accountable for helping to make that happen? Absolutely. Awesome. All right, so we're going to open it up to the room now. Um, and uh, whoever has a question, please say it loud and proud. I always have questions. Michelle Galea Holland from San Antonio. Um, I got uh, a, a cheat sheet because I heard Ryan helping with prep, and he didn't ask the question that I hoped was asked today. Um, and I'm curious because this is the first majority female panel that we've had. The other one was <laughs> ladies in the house. Very happy. We love you too, sir. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm having fun up here. So. Yes. And I think as a woman in leadership, there's, there's often, and a woman of color in leadership, there's often so much to navigate. And also, it's, it's easy to, to, to really, you know, superwoman pose in the mirror and talk about <laughs> stepping into your power. Uh, but in an, an environmental stressor that I encounter is often having to navigate how to um, present or show up in my power in spaces where perhaps my leadership, for a variety of reasons, the color of my skin, my youth, um, and on my gender, uh, may not be what folks who have power are used to engaging with. And so I'd love to open up and create space to hear from all the brilliant executive women that are on this panel who can talk about how they have navigated the power dynamics of being a woman in leadership doing this work in this time. Uh, all right, all right, I'll start, I'll start. So. Um, thank you. What a great question. And I wish I had been thinking about it for two days so I'd have a nice, succinct um, answer for you. Um, a couple of things. I mean, all of us, I'm sure, on this panel can tell you nightmare stories about being marginalized, uh, isolated from decisions, being diminished, um, having men steal our ideas. I mean, we, 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 we've all been there, right? Um, there's also something that I can say as a woman of a certain age now. Um, it gets better as you get older because you don't care about making people happy anymore. Right? You just don't care about that. And, and so you, you are more able to speak truth to power. You are more able to wear sneakers on your panel today. Um, you know? Um, you can wear, you can put lipstick on as a, as a position, as a power move, yeah. right? So, so I mean, all of these things change. So, so I guess I would say my skin has gotten thicker. I care less. I've got more experience. I'm also gentler with the world at the same time that I extend courtesy and grace more than I did when I was younger. And maybe that's also about getting older and having a little bit more experience and recognizing that it's not always about me, right? Somebody's having a bad day or somebody's had just a really hard life and you know they're coming in with different assumptions about me the same way I might have come in with assumptions about them. So trying to extend grace has been helpful. Um, but thank you for asking that and um, yeah, I can't wait to hear what my colleagues have to say. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Carol, for going first. No, um, I mean, I, what I thought of, and thank you for that question, Michelle, um, is similar to, to Carol. I feel, I feel like I spent the first part of my career trying to like hide everything that I am. And don't show your emotion. Do not cry. Yeah. Do not show any vo vulnerability. Bite the inside of your cheek. I was literally told by someone to bite the inside of your cheek if you start to show some emotion. And through the last two and a half years, as we navigated the most traumatic experience that any of us have ever gone through in our lives, um, you know, showing up with that shared vulnerability and care, I think is the best way that I was able to display my leadership. Um, uh, and I, I just, I feel like similar to Carol, I have stopped caring so much. I'm still on a journey, I feel like there are times. 
um, when I need to, to work on that. But um, I do think that um, women are uniquely positioned to lead um, in this work. And I see, you know, we were commenting that there are a lot of women in this room and we're glad to be up here on this stage together. Um, but uh, yeah, thank you for that question. And um, I, the last thing I would say is there are many strong women, some in this room who have been my mentors mm -hmm. and helped me navigate some really tricky situations and you know who you are. And um, I'm just really grateful for you. Wow. Um, <laughs> I'm also really grateful for the question, right? I'm really grateful to sit with the question. So thank you so much, sister, for asking, um, especially as a woman of color who is also a founder of an organization. Um, yes, all of those experiences. Um, the other thing is, as I get older, as I get ready to reach my 5.0, I'm also caring a lot less. The other thing that I have learned on this journey is that um, the ability to step into my own power as a woman leader is equivalent to my self-care and my self-love. The more I take care of myself, the more I love myself, the more I create a space of wellness around me and in my company, right, the more powerfully we are able to step into the work and I'm able to sit in this seat on this stage. Um, and I think, you know, it translates into the work that I do around power, right? I have to stand in my own power to do that work. And again, after the past two and a half years, given the state of democracy, I also sit on the board of Planned Parenthood, right? I don't have time. <laughs> I don't have time to play small um, in this work right now. And so that's the conviction that I wake up with every day. Um, again, as I grow in my leadership, um, as I learn to, to invest in myself and take care of myself, I'm more able to show up powerfully in this role. Thank you for saying that it gets easier. <laughs> um, I, um, I think the biggest lesson I've learned is that I don't have to show up like any other leader. And it's okay to just show up as I am. And I... I want to listen. I want to know. I want to hear what you have to say. I want to know where you're coming from, your life story, before I actually make decisions, before I figure out how I'm going to lead and think about an organization or a partnership of five organizations coming together. And I will also like to point out, I work with government. And even over the course of the last two days, most of our government leaders who spoke are men. And so these rooms are difficult when you walk in, but I also know that I don't, I'm not going to take bullshit anymore. Mm -hmm. um, if you're a mayor and you're gonna to come to me and say, this is what I wanna do and I don't think that's right, like I'm gonna tell you I don't think it's right and I'm gonna tell you why and we're gonna say, here's what we can offer to make you a better leader and also make your city a better place or a county a better place for others to live. I feel wildly underqualified to answer this question because I am still learning. I would say going gray prematurely has really helped and <laughs> spending time with the women on this stage, frankly, uh, and others like them. So <laughs> I, the, we can learn together, Michelle. <laughs> Hi, my name's Jacqueline. I'm from Hartford, Connecticut. And I think we've talked a lot about um, during these conversations, like the incredible need for system transformation, system redesign. And I would love to hear what tactics and strategies you've seen in your networks that you think have been the most effective in supporting that system transformation. Yeah, um, I can I can start, but I know everyone here um, is working on this. Um, so I mean, for us, it's all about how do we measure and get to measurement of, of change in measuring systems change and systems transformation is not easy. And so we actually went through a process with our national network of communities to understand you know, we're, we're, so at Strive Together, we have seven cradle to career outcomes that we, that all of our communities track and uh, track movement there. But really, it's how the systems are performing that get to those outcomes. So we have started uh, working with our partnerships to track systems indicators. So these are really contributing indicators to moving those outcomes. So, so in a, in a class or in a, in a school district, do the teacher demographics match the demographics of the district? We know that has an impact on whether or not 
students of color, have teachers of color. And so those are the types of contributing or systems indicators. All across, like for us, it's education, but also housing. You know, what's the, um, what is the availability of stable housing in a community? And so measuring systems, um, we're working on this. We have, we have resources that we've created, so I'm happy to share those. Uh, so that you can see them, but it is definitely a, a test of change. But I think to do systems work, we have to be measuring whether or not we're changing the system, and, and that's how we've focused our work in systems. You know, I, I want to just jump on something. I'm, I'm listening to us talk, and listening to us talk over the last um, day and a half. The language we use to talk about our work is so ineffective. Right? When we talk about systems change, how do you, how, I mean, talk about the family dinner conversation. How do you tell your mother in law about what you do? And, oh, I'm in systems change. I mean, we, I, and it is, it's, the, it's what we do, right? It's like we, we need different words to communicate our messages. Um, the same issue around equity. Um, we're doing some work with Frameworks Institute right now, and they've just done a lot of really powerful focus groups that tell us that if you say equity to most people in America, they think it's got something to do with their house value, right? So let me say, we are not our audience. We need to come up with new ways to tell our story, to tell what we do, to make it resonate with people so we can get more people involved in this work. Because if I go into my wonk speak, which I am wont to do, um, I know I lose people. When I can figure out how to talk so um, my in-laws know what I'm talking about and other people who are not in this work know what I'm talking about, then I know I'm on to something. But we've got a lot of work to do around narrative, around language, and around messaging if we're going to really make this a movement that is transformative. The examples that come to mind for me, um, as no surprise, all have to do with community organizing. Um, where I have seen the most change in the work that I've done is when folks have been organized, and I'm talking about residents, I'm talking about organizations and coalitions. I mean, we just, uh, I, were, I used to live in Louisiana and the biggest criminal justice package was, you know, was uh, spearheaded by formerly incarcerated folks who themselves were organized, built coalitions with other allies. And so to me, that's where I've seen the biggest silver bullet is in actually organizing people and communities to build power, right, to then be able to transform and completely redesign systems. To me, that's where I've seen the biggest change. And since we have Ryan on the panel, um, I'm gonna give an example from San Antonio that we just had recently where um, before we even get to talk about government systems, we need to make sure our government leaders, our county executives, our city leaders have a shared language around what it means to do racial justice work and what data they've collected that is perpetuating racism, what, um, how they work together, what are their lines of communication, have they ever collaborated with people in the community and what does actually centering resident mean? And, and so like that, it's then going into the level of like, a shared definition that allows us to talk about some of the systems that government actually run and own, and, and many of those systems need to be completely broken and redesigned, and how do we make sure we redesign them with the right residents and with the right community partners at the table. And I just want to say this, Jen, the work that I've seen has also been inside-outside game, right? So there are conversations that are happening with public officials, whether they be legislators or the governor or mayor's offices, as well as community organizing and agitating on the outside. It's really about those things converging. <laughs> um, that really is where the transformation happens. I would add to that that we've seen great successes to the point of inside outside where there are strategic relationships that can be leveraged. And sometimes it's not the person who's in charge of an agency. Sometimes it's a middle manager. But wherever there are those points of opportunity to build relationships and push even small shifts that can add up to bigger change, we've seen folks have a lot of success. And I, I think along the same lines as what um, everyone's uh, said so far, um, it's really about collaboration, right? It's teamwork makes the dream work. And the, the other um, aspect of it is, I heard Brian Stevenson's name um, echoed earlier today, and there's one thing he talks about that's always resonated with me, and it's, it's about being proximate to where the issues 
and problems are, right? And not and recognizing that no single individual has all the answers, but you need to go to the people that are being impacted by your work, um, the decisions you're making. Um, they need to be at the forefront. Um, you got to basically touch, feel them. Um, you know, as it's always been said, you can't serve the people if you don't love the people. All right, I say teamwork, you say dream work. Teamwork. 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 Big round of applause for our panel. Thank you all. <laughs>